Okay, good morning. This is really work that was driven by Dave Hauser, who is a former graduate student of mine at the University of Michigan before I moved to USC. Dave is on the job markets this year, so in case you have a job, he's out there. Uh, the work I'll, I'll talk about was driven by a nasty reviewer. And this is a literal quote from the review, and that review came in like two years ago. Experiments should be done in settings where people pay attention. There is nothing that can be learned from MTurk, except perhaps that multitasking <laughs> produces dumb answers. You have no idea what these guys are doing while they answer your questionnaire, so just forget about this MTurk crap. And the editor agreed, and Dave was all upset and said, no, that can't be true. It really looks otherwise, except that there wasn't that much evidence for that. And so as we did more experiments, we built in a number of these methods controls. And here's you know, kind of what, we look, what we're looking at. Uh, do subject pool participants actually pay more attention than MTurkers? Basically, everybody thinks so. Because in your subject pools, there's an experimenter who watches you. And you're in the subject pool because you're presumably a psychology major and you're interested in this stuff. Uh, but uh, you don't really know. And uh, the answer may surprise you. And uh, the second question is, once you start using attention checks, which people on MTurk usually do in MTurk research, what does the, what does the attention check actually do? And are there consequences for response behavior down the road? So that on the one hand, you know these guys are paying attention, but you actually just changed how they're going about their tasks. So I'll tell you about a, a number of studies along those lines. And in all of these, Dave is a, is a first author, and I'm, I'm no, uh, giving you an overview of such stuff. Who pays more attention? So the common wisdom is very straightforward. I mean, as I already said, I mean, people believe that your subject pool participants are really interested. That's why they're psychology majors. And they want to find out something. And they're interested there. And your experimenter is watching them. Uh, Turkers do not pay much attention because they want to earn a few pennies. Why else would they be there? Nobody sees what they do. So they're actually on Facebook, on chat. They listen to music. They drink their beer. And they're answering a few questions. And when you ask in some of these studies and you say, anything else you did while answering the questionnaire? Yes, they are multitasking. And they're also on Facebook and they're also answering chats and so on. And that initially motivated the development of attention checks, which was done by Danny Oppenheimer, who uh, was at Princeton at that time, is now at UCLA, uh, which he called instructional manipulation checks. And it looks something like this. This is a screenshot from one of our experiments. But it's, it's very much modeled after the Oppenheimer task. So when you look at this, you could basically, if you don't care too much, quickly skip all this crappy text and just go to that, because it looks as if you can answer it. Uh, which of these activities do you engage in regularly? Check all that apply. Except when you, use, when you read the small print, it tells you that we're interested in whether you pay attention. Hence, please ignore the next question. <laughs> Click other and type in, I read the instructions. Okay, And on MTurk, uh, payment and, and reputation ratings are often tied to that. So as a researcher, uh, you can make sure that people will do that because they're basically worried that you may not pay them or that you may give them a bad reputation rating. And as a result of that, uh, on the one hand, you are assessing whether they pay attention. But on the other hand, you're also teaching them to pay attention uh, because if an MTurker runs into these things a couple times, they may be very much on the lookout in future studies. So you're changing what your sample does. You're changing what the population does that you're using in your studies. Uh, as, a, as a first look at this, uh, Dave looked at data from the Many Labs project uh, that was published in Social Psychology. And this is just a secondary analysis. Uh, these are the MTurkers. Who, uh, what I'm showing you here is a, is a pass rate. Uh, MTurkers pass attention check at 94%. Everybody else in these online studies comes from subject pools, but does it at home and online and is lower in the pass rates. These pass rates are actually quite good. Uh, 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 but I mean, uh, that's uh, you know, the main point here. Uh, this is a larger data sample 
where the sample uh, site includes labs. So these guys, except for MTurk, are uh, not online. These are people in labs, and you see how far down this goes. And in these analyses, always MTurk comes out really well. Uh, that prompted Dave to look more closely, because we had a, a hard time getting the details on, on some of these other things, to look more closely as we ran other studies, uh, what, how, how does a lab compare to the rest? And this is our subject pool uh, compared to MTurk. And uh, when you put in the kind of attention checks that I just showed you with a sports question, and our subject pool, University of Michigan subject pool, is online, they pass at 39%. So the majority of your subjects does not read the instructions. Had they read the instructions, they would have noticed that they should say, other, I have read the instructions. That's not what they do. That is with the experimenter, that, that is when they are at home and answering online for credit in the subject pool. Uh, the MTurk participants are selected in the following way. The selection is a strict criterion that follows current recommendations for best practices. The current best practice recommendations in psychology are that you select MTurkers who have at least 100 hits with a 95% approval rating. Now, that is a very selected sample. Many MTurkers do not have 100 hits, but this is realistically what most people do these days. So we are comparing current rec recommended practices against the subject pool, which are the two routines in, in psychology using that. We are not looking at MTurkers who have five hits and bad reputation ratings and so on. What's a hit? A hit is a human intelligence task, which is whatever these guys do and get paid for. That's just MTurk language. Oh, it's a task. Yeah. Who have done at least 100 tasks and got 95% approval rating for their performance on these, on these 95 tasks. Uh, there are services, other services available, Crowdflower and, and other, such, other such things. They're much smaller, they're a little more expensive, and uh, they're for various reasons less popular. But Ulf can tell you more about that than, than I can. I think MTurk is pretty much the largest base you can access. You can also restrict it. In our case, it's restricted to uh, American IPs. Amer no, US uh, uh, internet addresses. And um, it's pretty much the big elephant in the, in the field. So uh, I wonder about the concern for um, impacting your approval ratings or your hits on MTurk, because I know that uh, that's a big factor in driving you know, your yield for getting certain yeah. workers. Quick to answer a question, yeah, yeah, and trap question. Yeah, there, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we don't want we don't want to irritate. Well, I'll, I'll get to that. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll get to that. So um, when you look now at at the at under C selection criteria for the M Turk, those guys pass at ninety five percent, right? So I mean, it's it's absolutely the opposite to what reviewers often tell you or what editors are worried about. Now, supposedly, all of this would be better. Once the same subject pool, and this is a random assignment, once the same subject pool is in the lab rather than online. And so in the next condition, we are comparing students who are actually sitting in the lab with an experimenter present. And that gets you 26% pass rate, <laughs> as opposed to the online MTurk standard thing of 96%. Right? So anybody who's worried about, uh, about that, um, you know, should keep that in mind. Now, so these results that I'm showing you and also the results of the secondary analysis are at odds with studies from the early days of MTurk. So when Danny Oppenheimer created these trap questions uh, to check for attention, at that time, really, the attention rate at MTurk was much lower, which suggests that it is a function of two things. Uh, one is that MTurkers learn and you just taught them that if they're not paying attention, then they will be screened out. And when you select people who have more than 100 tasks, 
they probably have seen some of that. And many MTurkers who do questionnaires do many, many questionnaires. I mean, it is not the case that these guys are naive subjects who have never seen this stuff. Um, and, and so, I mean, by, by you know, a lot of, of that is probably driven by this criterion of having experienced Turkers. And um, moreover, they probably learn to recognize this. And you may worry that these manipulation checks have a particular format. You get a, a large block of text that you're supposed to read, uh, which basically tricks you into not reading it. And then you have an open text box where you have to enter something. And so it may not really require that much attention. You may be, as a decent Turker, you may have an eye for this. When something pops up that's a huge amount of text and it has an open box in the questions, and probably there's something that you pay, should pay attention to. And that may really mean the attention check does not really indicate attention. So we did a different one. We created one that uh, MTurkers would not know. It has a small line of text, and it has no open text box to answer anything open. And the small line of text tells you, finally, we have a few demographic questions for you. Please answer the questions below. And then it says, just one line, for the next question, mark the first two response options to demonstrate attention. And that's a question where the first two response options are unlikely to be chosen by anybody because it asks you for which political parties you strongly affiliate with. And it gives you the Citizens Party and the Socialist Action Party as the first two options, which you are now supposed to check to show that you have paid attention. This is a much harder one because you don't immediately see it. It's only one sentence in there. And we would expect that the rates are much lower. But of interest is, are the MTurkers still doing better? Is the next question that question or the one following it? That is the question. Yeah? So, 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 that is a screenshot. That's, okay. that's what it looks like. And um, in the subject pool, we are now down to 2% who read that instruction sentence and actually follow instructions. Okay? 2%. <laughs> And in MTurk, we are still at 26%. So clearly, I mean, there is an ambiguity in this, but clearly it suggests that a lot of the high pass rates on MTurk are not because they're really conscientiously reading all instructions, but because they have a bit of an eye for what the instruction trap questions, catch questions look like. And yes, they're doing much better at reading the instructions, but not quite at the 96% rank, right? 96% um, range. So does reading the instructions make a difference? I mean, is, are people who pay that much attention actually giving us better data? Uh, I mean, that's the, the next question. And what we're doing here is we're giving people a task that um, requires you to pay attention to one word. It's a task, where it's a, it's a judgment task, and you're told that you're on the beach with a friend, and your friend is going to the restroom, and over there there's also a, a chance to get a beer, and your friend says, should I bring you a beer? And uh, you're asked how much you're willing to pay for that beer. And the only difference is that in one version, the beer is, is sold by a rundown grocery store, that's over there where the guy goes to the bathroom, and in the other version, it's sold by the fancy resort where he goes to go to the bathroom. And people assume that grocery store beer is cheaper than fancy resort beer, and so is that reflected in willingness to pay and to what extent? And um, if we do that in the subject pool, then the store beer, they offer three bucks for the store beer. And in the resort, they offer 350 for a difference of just under 20%. When we do that on MTurk, they offer 150 for the store beer, but three bucks for the resort beer for a difference of 100%. Clearly indicating that the subject pool group, that the MTurk pool, is much more sensitive to minor variations in the text of the task. And it's a meaningful variation because it takes into account your real life experience with what a beer costs. Well, we I wanted to, yeah? I don't know if this is the point in time for the question, but tell me if you want to put it off, but who are these hundred hit people that have all this time on their hands to do this 
Yeah. Maybe they don't have jobs or they don't have a life. And uh, uh, so, so, all, so all kinds of people. So, so, all, ki so all kinds of people. Okay. Uh, uh, this goes from high school kids to housewives. It's people who must have some boredom and uh, who kind of enjoy doing these different things mm -hmm. and earn a few pennies doing that. Uh, Ulf may know more about this. I mean, we did a bit of a lit search to learn about this. Um, it, it's not clear that there is a, a, a very particular aspect to that. This can be your babysitter who's bored to death while watching the babies. So the babies are in bed and you're sitting there on your laptop. Or it's, it's uh, I, I don't know. Among you the high reputation people are, are a lot of professionals. They do it, you know, that, that's their living. You know, so, so this is the, the selection you have, right? Like more than 100. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. See, see other, the other interesting piece that I picked up from, from looking at that, uh, not perusing that literature a bit, is that a lot of people do it during work. So you're, you're at your job, somebody else is paying for your time anyway, you're bored to death, and, and you, you do some of those. So, so it, yeah. I'll, I'll talk a little about this later, but um, me and my colleague, we're actually doing an ethnography of, of uh -huh. crowd workers, including some cancer crowd workers. So the, um, the picture you should have in your head is um, someone who's underemployed. So they have a job, but whatever reason, it doesn't cover their needs. So they're using this to fill in the gap. Another picture you should have in your head is someone who, like, think of like an administrative assistant and their boss is out of town. So they, they, they don't have a ton to do. So they can play Minesweeper or they could earn money on the web. Uh, another picture you should have in your head is like, uh, like, like Norbert said, um, a caregiver. Maybe they're caring for an elderly person, and that person's taking a nap, and they have an hour. So that's another kind of picture you should have in your head. Um, a lot of people think they're not intelligent. That couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah. They're actually way more intelligent than, than uh, yeah. the most, most lab uh, subjects that I've that seen. Yeah. yeah, and they're quite sophisticated. I and, mean, they're and making so money yeah. on the internet. Then think I about how advanced that's going to be. I one more question to this discussion, yeah. and because as, as somebody who frequently runs subject school subjects, reviewers' comments saying these undergraduates aren't real people. Um, I wonder whether your data, Norbert, would uh, lend, you know, support that argument that um, the undergraduate uh, subjects aren't real people, because real people are uh, well. showing an effect of a variable here that uh, you know well, I yeah, but I, I think to some extent that's just a function of, of attention, right? If, if the undergraduates, uh, when, we, when we do a relatively small, you know, as, as in the previous one, attention check, if they pass the attention check at 2%, because that's how much attention they pay to the details of the text in front of their eyes, uh, uh, then, then you would expect that kind of thing. Is that M -Turgers I mean, m turkers are more real in the sense of more diverse in, in terms of demographics than our undergraduate psychology subject pool. Uh, but, but that, of course, not close to anything representative. There are well-known older studies that show that if you run a lab experiment at the beginning of a semester, you get very different data than when you run it at the end, right? So that's also in support of your yeah. attention hypothesis. Yeah. And I, uh, just one point to add is that I recently saw a review uh, for a paper on, on this and um, think that many people have been using the MTurk sample now. And there are around 7,200 of those serious participants, right? So if you have 20, 72 departments with 100 subjects each, right, that makes up for the same, but these are going to be different samples. So if we are going to yeah. replicate, right, we're tapping into different yeah. undergraduate, but different undergraduate samples yeah. worldwide. And this is just one pool. This is, this is one pool that we're all using, and when you're using tasks that, that are similar tasks for, ma for many researchers, then these guys will be very experienced. So Sit I have and a question about this, this, this finding. Um, it's, it's known that the uh, MTurk subject pool, their, their incomes are a little bit lower. Yeah. So could this just be 
not just the pool effect, but also they're more price sensitive. Yeah. Say yeah, but 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 that's relative. that's why I'm drawing on the rel on the relative thing, right? So I would have expected this. I would have expected that's uh, lower, right? I mean that's there. Uh, yeah, but it could be but that if you're not spending a lot of time in fancy resorts, you get intimidated by them, so you think everything's really expensive there, so you exaggerate that effect. But 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 I'm I'm not I'm not that much <coughs> interested in the absolute level here. What I'm interested in is to what extent. Uh, of between these samples, there's a difference in responding to the resort. And you're saying it's not just a function of, of paying attention to the difference, but also how much you think. The, the, yeah, yeah, no, I, fair, yes. Just a second. Um, yeah. I don't, maybe I, I don't know if you mentioned this, I might have missed it, but I think was there subject pool um, participants paid or involved with some sort of contingency on the performance? No, so sub <coughs> everything follows standard best practice which means subject pool participants get credit for participating in a course. So not being incentivized to pay attention to detail. Do you think that could play some? Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean anything that you can do to uh, pay people, I mean, to incentivize people to read text that may be irrelevant to your task or may not, or, or may not be irrelevant uh, would presumably do that. But what we are looking at is should you assume that your subject that you, that your subject pool acts like your M or that your M is worse or better in, in, in following that, right? So we're we are following basically best practice guidelines for psychology subject pool versus psychology M Turk use. No. That they pay less attention to the difference between yeah. the score and the result. Yeah. So my question, I guess, is whether there are also, besides this experiment, there are also other experiments you could like measure the attention between the <laughs> subjects. Well, I'm, I'm whether it's doable or not. But yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, see, see attention, uh, the standard attention measure are these attention checks that I showed you before. So you already done that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right? Uh, now, of course, in this experiment, what we had, what, what we had hoped for, for for this stuff, right, is that we can also compare those who did or did not pass the attention check, mm -hmm. except that with two percent in our subject pool, that was a part of this study that we simply couldn't do, right? I mean, we had thought that we would have a higher pass rate here in, in Amtrak as in the other things. That, that's what we assumed. And there would be an overall sample difference, and we could trace it by looking at the guys who did pass the attention check versus did not. But I mean, by the time you're down to 2%, there's not much, not much left there. And in all the other studies, by the time we are up to 96% of MTurgers passing, so there's also not much we can do to look at, uh, do the MTurgers who don't pass look more like our subject pool people, right? Uh, I mean, we're, we're actually running into the limits of these extreme things unless we use, we use very large samples, and, and no, we, didn't, we didn't go there. So let me... Uh, go to the next, to the next thing. Um, in many ways, uh, measuring... Uh, no, if these guys pay attention is nice and it tells you something about the differences that you can expect there. But I mean, these very popular <coughs> IMCs, instructional manipulation checks, are essentially uh, um, <laughs> likely to do something else. They are intended only to measure attention, but every measurement is a treatment. And what you're just teaching people is there are traps. I mean, I'm giving you a question that is not the kind of thing that you expect. It looks very differently, and I'm teaching you that some questions are not what they seem. And we should not assume that this has no consequences. And so in the next set of studies, we're looking at what are the consequences once you start teaching people that the questions you give them may really not be what they think they're answering. And uh, we think that there are a, a number of possible things. One is we would expect that there's closer scrutiny 
to all kinds of subsequent questions to determine what their meaning may be. Is there any hidden thing going on here? I have just been showing you that it's not what meets the eye. And that could presumably help you when my next questions have something of a nature of a trick task, where you have to pay close attention to minor detail to get there. I have also been teaching you that the usual norms of, of a cooperative discourse in the sense of, of crisis logic of conversation do not apply. Uh, in the regular discourse, we assume that the speaker is trying to be informative, truthful, and clear. And I just showed you that this is not what I'm doing. I'm asking you a question, but you're not supposed to answer my question. You're supposed to do something else, check other and write in some, some other stuff. Uh, if that is the case, then uh, these questions may also change your reliance on quasi cooperative norms, which may reduce a number of context effects in questionnaires that reflect quasi norms. And I'll tell you a bit more about that. And finally, anything that teaches you that they're checking my attention here may get you to pay more attention, which should help you on tasks that we now require very close attention. And so we did a series of experiments looking at that. Um, and uh, you can't do that with a standard, uh, no, by looking at the standard use of these measures, you essentially have to do, um, treat this not as a measurement, but as a treatment. And so we are running something where you get the instructional manipulation check and send the dependent variable versus the dependent variable and send the instructional manipulation check. And in principle, again, uh, you, one might hope that we can look at both a measured component, the guys who do or do not pass the, the, the check, and the treatment component, which is the order effect. But we never manage to look at the measured component because in the end, the m turgers are always set high, so that there's not much uh, left. We could do that by, by going down to uh, selection criteria that are atypical, uh, which no, uh, isn't that useful for other reasons. So in that first study, uh, um, Dave has been looking at the cognitive reflection test, which is a very popular uh, task by Shane Frederick. It offers you, it, it pulls three tasks of this type. In a lake, there is a patch of lily pads. Every day, the patch doubles in size. If it takes 48 days for the patch to cover the entire lake, how long would it take for the patch to cover half of the lake? And about half of the people say, oh, half the lake, half the days, and say 24 days. Except when the damn thing doubles every day, then from half to full, it's one day, right? So it takes 47 days to cover half the lake, which is a, 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 a not the intuitively obvious answer for most people. It requires that you actually pay close attention and run the numbers. And um, the CRT is uh, popular uh, uh, in, in many areas because it actually predicts real life outcomes. People who do better on the CRT have better returns in their investment account and are doing better on saving for their retirement and a few other such things. Not huge differences, but reliable differences in, in let's say, the health and retirement study. And the attention check that we're using is a sports participation question from Danny Oppenheimer, which I showed you as my first screenshot, which is a thing that asks you which sports you like. And there's a big block of text that says, uh, do I have it here? No, I don't. Uh, which is a big block of text that says, uh, please ignore this question and write in other and check other and then type in I read the instructions, right? So that's a, a trick question. Okay. If we do the cognitive reflection test first and send the IMC, uh, there's the, the, the attention check, uh, people spend 44 seconds on the CRT question. When we do the attention check first, they spend 55 seconds. That's a large increase in attention here, in time spent on the task. So clearly, having the attention check first, which makes you realize there's questions that aren't quite what they look like, makes you put more time into the task. It all, oops, what's happening here? Well, something's missing. Uh, these, are, these are the performance rates. This is when the, uh, when the uh, 
CRT comes first, they get 1.3 out of 3 correct, and when the attention check comes first, that goes up to 1.76 out of 3. So that's a highly significant increase in uh, performance on the cognitive reflection test. And this is a distribution of scores. This is uh, the cognitive reflection test first. This is the IMC first. And as you can see, it basically gets better across the whole thing. These are people who get all three rights at 36% here, 19% here, 27 to 25, 15 to 26, and 22 to 30. So clearly, the, the you know, poor responses go down and the better responses go up. And it's, it's very clear that uh, giving people an attention check early in your sequence changes how they go about the next task. And if you look at that, it basically makes them smarter if you believe that the CRT tests something like uh, your actual no, skill at solving these tasks. We also looked at whether the Attention checks change, uh, not prompt more reflective thought on these things with a different task. In this task, your goal is to draw a black marble from these boards without looking. So you're blindfolded and you have to uh, draw a marble. Which tray would you prefer? Uh, it's, this is a probabilistic reasoning task. Most people prefer this tray because there are more black marbles, so you have a better chance, apparently. Uh, but if you do the numbers, it turns out that on this thing, the odds are 1 out of 10. And because there's two empty rows in here, which you don't immediately notice, the odds here are 8 out of 100. So you really should go for this one rather than for that one. And uh, somehow my, my uh, slides don't quite work that way. Uh, but anyway, so once picking the proper tray, the small tray, or 61% when the task comes first, and that goes up to 74%, a 15% increase, quite sizable, 20% over base weight, kind of, uh, when the attention check comes first. So whenever you teach people that, you know, something may be tricky here, they got the message. That's kind of the idea. So measurements are treatments, and attention checks are treatments, not just measurements. And the trick questions alert participants to being tricked, and the rest follows from that. And uh, they're not giving you the obvious answer, because they have learned that sometimes the obvious is not the right thing. So in the, in the um, cases where you're giving attention checks first or second, was the attrition rate the same? Yeah. Good question. Cool. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. Yes, there's no significant difference in, yeah. And. Uh, we then wondered how far does it go, right? I mean, these things are basically saying um, you teach people that stuff is not the obvious and they pay more attention, which is fine. It's not very surprising. It's also possible that it goes beyond that. It's also possible that uh, you have also shown them that Christian conversational assumptions do not necessarily apply. So in the standard conversation, people are assumed to be to make contributions that are relevant to the conversations, that are truthful and clear. And people bring that to the research situation and interpret the speaker's utterances in that way, unless they have reason to assume otherwise, that you have ulterior motives and that there may be something else going on. And uh, that brings uh, a set of systematic context effects to research situations that you would otherwise not observe. And for me, that was a chance to revisit things I did in the late 80s and early 90s. And um, here's a few examples and what we did with them. Uh, uh, no, I'm ahead of my, <laughs> I'm ahead of my slides. Uh, the second thing that you, may, that you may assume is that people are less likely to satisfy. So in the literature in particular on survey context effects and questionnaire constructions, there's two biggies. One is that people pay close attention to what you're saying and how your question is structured and draw inferences from that that you may not have intended because they assume that everything you do is relevant. The so second assumption is the second set of stuff is John Krosnick's work on satisfying that they really don't care that much about. 
and they're trying to make life easy. So they go with the first things that you present, which is a response order, results in a response order effect. Say whenever they have a chance to say don't know, they will say don't know instead of thinking about it and giving you a substantive answer, etc. And so if these manipulation checks increase attention, you would expect that those effects go down. Right? Whereas you would expect that the other effects, the Kweisian inferences, uh, I mean, also come, also come down, but for a somewhat different reason. So we did, um, we did a series of these things looking at both of that. So we used survey items that show robust conversational effects in the first set before versus after an attention check. And we are looking at the impact of the attention check on the emergence of these things. We have two samples, 798 and 397 uh, um, uh, uh, US IP addresses. And we vary the order. And that gives us a power of about 82 to, 93 to 98% to detect an effect with an effect size of D.3, which is much smaller than these effects usually are. The effects that we're using have an effect size and the standard thing of about 0.5. Okay, one of the classics here is fictitious issues. So when you ask people about things that don't exist, they give you an answer anyway. And Howard Schumann was the first to show that with a study on the Agricultural Trade Act of 1977. When you ask Americans about this, the thing doesn't exist, they give you an answer. They tell you if they're in favor or opposed to it. And survey researchers have long assumed that this really reflects that you get completely meaningful answers. They're just throwing a dice. Uh, uh, 20 years later or so, 15 years later, we showed that that's not the case. What you're doing as a researcher by asking people about something that doesn't exist is that you're violating conversational norms. I shouldn't ask you questions that make no sense. Your listener can assume that you're trying to make sense and hence does their best to make sense of what you're saying. And so we created experiments where we ask you about fictitious issues in a context that allow you to put different interpretations on a fictitious issue. So this is our 20, 2014 replication of that with, with new data. So in one version of the questionnaire, we ask you, how do you feel about Google's decision to allow users complete control over the data they share or choose not to share with advertisers? That's a positive thing. In the unfavorable context, we ask you, how do you feel about the government's decision to allow government agencies to look at your data? Right? And then two questions later, you get the actual target question that serves as a dependent variable. Congress has been considering the Data Sharing Act of 2013. Do you favor or oppose passage of that act? And based on our previous results, we expect that if an earlier question referred to Google giving you choice what to share, you think that's a good thing. And if an earlier question referred to the government getting access to your stuff, you think that's a bad thing. And that would illustrate that people assume that questions are meaningfully related to one another, that this is all an ongoing conversation, and that if I'm asking you something that you're not sure about what it is, it's probably a meaningful part of what we're talking about, and you're using that context to make that inference. And of interest now is, does the attention check undermine that? Does the attention check just, has the attention check just taught you that I'm basically fooling around with you? And that you cannot assume that when I'm asking you a question, it's meaningfully related to anything, because I'm also asking you questions which you shouldn't even answer and type in something else. Okay? And the answer is no, that doesn't happen. What we're getting is a very strong effect of the context. So 47% favor that uh, 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 data sharing act after the, in the positive context when Google allows you to share. But uh, only 9% favor it in the unfavor, support it in the unfavorable context when the preceding questions refer to the uh, government agencies. And uh, I, I only have one plot here because there's literally no difference in the, in the other. Uh, no, uh, where, where you have the, the, the attention check literally doesn't make a difference. And that's true across all the variants we did. Here's uh, another version of these kinds of things. According to standard textbooks, these are all 11-point rating scales. And uh, in the history of social sciences, we, we have started out with something, with something like this. 
This is a classic Likert scale, which goes from minus to plus. Then people realized you can you know, make the life of the coder easier because the coder has to ignore this and code it as if it were 1 to 10 or 1 to 11 by just giving people that. Or you could leave it all off and then you have even more coding errors because then your coder has to look at the other stuff. This is all in the olden days, right? So this stuff has changed with the technology, assuming it makes no difference. Except that your subjects actually do make a difference. And uh, again, in the early 90s, this is a public opinion quarterly piece from 91. Uh, we looked at this by asking, how successful have you been in life so far? And it, the scale always goes from not at all successful to extremely successful, but it runs from 0 to 10 versus from minus 5 to plus 5. And What? Uh, this question, how, how successful you are in life, uh, how does it compare to general population uh, as, as compared to common sense rules? It doesn't matter. This is an experiment um, that, that only deals with a scale format. Okay. I, I, I mean, we have done the 91 paper is actually with a representative German sample. But, but I mean, that's, I, I do not know. Okay. I, I haven't looked. I mean, this is a, an experiment with random assignment. And there's many versions of that, of that scale thing. What I'm interested in, just give me a sec, is the scale format. Um, when you look at that, it turns out that whenever you have what we call a unipolar scale, uh, where you go from one to something or from zero to something, people interpret this as if there's a lot of the attribute, and you can put in any attribute you want here, if there's a lot of the attribute or very little of that attribute. When you have a minus to plus scale, your numeric values indicate that this is bipolar. So there's a lot of an attribute and a lot of the opposite of that attribute. So as a result, checking something down here becomes, sorry, I didn't do anything great. Right? How successful have you been in life? One is, I didn't do anything great. <coughs> Not how successful have you been in life? Minus four is, sorry, I fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> Right? And not surprisingly, there are more people who say they haven't done anything great than there are people who say they fucked up. And the differences are large. And so we're, we're, we're trying that thing again. And again, we're getting the replication of the earlier thing. 45 per, this is percentage below the midpoint of the scale. So 45% go below the midpoint of the scale on the 0 to 10. 31% go below the midpoint of the scale on the minus 5 to plus 5 because you're shifting the meaning of the lower anchor. But again, uh, now p larger 0.40 uh, for the interaction. So the instruction and manipulation checks do not undermine Christian conversational norms. And we have five or so, six experiments in that set, and on none of the Christian items do we see anything. I mean, we always replicate the standard effect, and we do not get a, a, a change. So that's kind of off the table. This is now a satisfying item, and I have like five more minutes. This is now a satisfying item uh, modeled after a study by Norman Bradburn and colleagues, uh, which compares two popular formats. So from which of the following departments on Amazon.com have you made a purchase in the last 18 months? And you get 16 entries, and you are asked to check all that apply. Or you get all the same 16 things, and you have to say for each one, yes or no. And the standard finding is that people report much higher usage of anything when they have to say yes, no on everything, than when they have to just check all that apply. When, they, when you do check all that apply, they check a few and they're done with that question and move on, whereas with this one, they have to consider each one uh, more carefully. So we're doing the same thing, attention check first or after that, and again, mark all that apply gives you an average number of 3.6 reports. Yes, no format gives you an average number of 4.7. Uh, reports on this list of 16. And again, the interaction of format times order is a uh, larger point 40, and the instructional manipulation checks do not do anything on that. And again, we have five or six of these satisfying items, and we don't see that on anything. So, wrap up. Uh, 
the prevailing notion that MTurkers are inattentive and therefore you must use the IMC when running on MTurk is probably false. At least when you're uh, selecting for people with, with hits of 100 and plus and a 95% approval rate, these guys are paying a lot of attention. Nevertheless, the pass rate that we see, the very high pass rate that we see reflect in part that they can recognize what the attention check is. And when you're using attention checks that are less familiar and you're getting a bit more creative in how you do that, uh, your pass rates are a bit lower. So it is not the case that they're really reading all instructions very carefully. They also have an eye, given experience with these things, they have an eye on what's going on and they seem somewhat more attentive than they actually are. So the so standard check overestimates attention. Um, the prevailing notion also is that these instructional manipulation checks uh, do not affect participants. They just measure if they pay attention. That's clearly wrong. They do affect. They teach people something may be wrong here. And that prompts more reflective processing on questions that we think look for people like possible trick questions. When the question looks like a problem-solving task, then they're much more careful in that. Um, but it does not affect processing on questions that seem normal, like the survey questions, where there's nothing for the participant that clearly indicates there may be a, there may be a trick here. Right? I'm asking you to rate something, and you don't know that the other guys are getting a different scale format. So on those things, we don't see anything, which suggests that the treatment effect resulting from these attention checks is quite specific. And it's specific in telling you some questions are trick questions. And when it looks like a trick question, you really have to be careful. But if it doesn't look like what you think might be a trick question, then you're really not more thoughtful about it than under other conditions. Obviously, the absence of a treatment effect does not imply the absence of a measurement effect. So these people who are high in attention on these things may indeed be performing differently on these questions than people who are low in attention. We actually couldn't look at that in a sense that's also irrelevant for the practical question we asked uh, because at the pass rates we had, we didn't have a large enough N to actually look at the guys who don't pass. We are left with only a few people. And reversely, in the subject pool, we are only left with very few people who pay a lot of attention, which is in some sense a bigger message here. Our subject pools are much more sloppy than we would like to believe. So when you use these things, you need to essentially you know, weight the benefits, identifying the 10% who do not pay attention which is really what we're looking at on MTurk with standard selection criteria. You're looking at 10% max who do not pay attention. You have to weight those benefits against the costs, the sense that they trick me with regard to the task, which, um, which uh, is another issue. And as I said, the credit goes to Dave. <laughs> Questions, comments? Patricia. Very interesting. Um, it seems that your findings about context and how people um, do use the Gracian principles of, of relating um, a current conversational term to, set, to the context really indicates that there's a big problem with randomization of questions. And this has been bothering me for a long time because when you randomize, you're creating yeah. unintended context and you're yeah. making it also sometimes not make sense. It seems to me we should, uh, that, that the, an implication methodologically is that we should consider the context and use the context in a conversational way so we know what context they're using and so it makes sense. To the yes, I, I, I agree. I, I mean, randomization of questions is rarely a good choice. Uh, random, it's also something that no survey researcher in his right mind would ever do. Uh, randomization of questions makes sense within a block of questions. Let's say I have five personality items. I, I can randomize within that block. By the time you're randomizing the blocks, you're setting up a different conversational context. And people quite plausibly and justifiably assume that you're talking about something else. So jumping back and forth between topics is a bad thing. 
It also reduces, there's a lot of survey uh, <coughs> methods work on that. It also reduces uh, participant satisfaction with the survey. In panel studies, where you come back half a year later, it produces higher dropout because it's, it was an unpleasant task. And uh, when you ask people how long they think the interview was, they feel that the interview lasted forever. Uh, because there was no flow to it, right? I mean, as you start disrupting the flow, subjective time goes up, and so they think you were stealing an hour of that time, which then contributes to these lower response rates. So that, that's a problem. On the other hand, context effects are large enough that you want to know what your context does. And so it, it makes sense to, to you know, alternate blocks and so on, but you have to be really sensitive uh, you know, for what you're looking for and, and um, test for context effects without ruining the conversational flow of the interview, which is really your, your bigger risk, I think. I, I cannot I cannot tell you none of none of our sequences was that long uh, so are a few studies uh, but nothing that I know is published uh, where people had differentially long studies and moved the attention check from the beginning to the end I've, I've, I heard I heard about this once but that guy also only had about 30 questions so th that's not clear what you would really what you would really want to know is you would really want to have your more survey type one hour interview and move your attention check you know, from front to back for different subsets of the, of the sample. And I'm not aware of anybody who has done that. Also, MTurk studies are usually very short. That, that's the other part. Yeah. Um, one of the things you mentioned during your talk was that these attention check questions can, are teaching the worker various things as, as time goes on. Um, but as a sub, what, what do you, any thoughts about whether the subject pool is learning or whether there's just selection? That is to say, if you can't get these things right, a lot of your hits get rejected and then, and then you drop out of the subject pool. Well, I, I think there's learning. If there were no learning, you wouldn't see these order effects on the CRT and so on, right? I mean, that's an indication that they learn. And, and I think there's both learning and dropout. I mean, if you, if you don't uh, get these things right, then uh, there's dropout at least in the usage. If you, if you don't get these things right, your approval rating comes down, and then you're no longer selected. You may still be in the pool, but not in the pool given the selection criteria. Yeah, but, but we can't separate that. But it's clear that there is some learning going on. Yeah? Yes. So in a way, it makes it, again, maybe 75% of yeah. the time or 80% of the time that that doesn't carry into your experiment and minimize the effect of yeah. where you place your attention yeah. checks. Yeah. So it I mean, we're getting, more amazing, yeah. I we're getting this over and above what these guys have already learned, right. presumably. Yes. But w would you say that in, in those 100 hit people that probably 90% or 80% or some high percentage of the time they've already had attention checks in there? Y yes, yeah. yes. I, I think that most people on MTurk, uh, most people who run studies on MTurk include an attention check. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, then these people have at least seen a good dozen, if not more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, let me thank you first to, you know, I always love the stuff you do and actually you know, the, like the um, numbering, the bipolar scales, and so we've replicated it several times, and so that's really a true effect. Yeah, that's a robust. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I was wondering, we did some studies also on MTurk, um, the attention check, you know, I think would differ for tasks where you look for performance versus tasks where people are asked to uh, think about themselves, let's say personality items. Any ideas about that? I mean, you, your, your assumption is when it, when it looks like a complicated task, then I'm getting this. 
and when it looks like I'm just giving you my opinion about some things and I'm not getting this. That's compatible with, you know, what I, with what we have. When I said, well, if it looks like a question in which you may be tricked, you know, like a reasoning task or arithmetic, I mean, it's a lily patch on the lake or something like that. Um, that's where we are seeing it. And presumably, uh, people think they know themselves well and would give you the personality items mm -hmm. quickly. But you do, of course, get conversational effects on the personality items. Mm -hmm. So when we do the, the let's say, the, the numeric values manipulation on a, on a personality item, you see that stuff shift. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't expect that this falls into the filter of where do these guys trick me. Right. Yeah. going to go and not not recommend my hit in the approval <coughs> system of MSERC now because I've used a attention monitoring question. Um, is, is, the in, is the impact for the approval rating of the hit that yeah. is now playing more and more of a role on, you know, in what you get in terms of yeah, your, yeah, yeah. your yield? Yeah. Uh, is that going to is that we, ha we, have not, yeah. we have not seen that. Uh, we have not seen that. I mean, we have looked as, as part of these attention studies in the beginning. We have looked at whether, say, post, for example, that there is an uh, attention check in the study and so on, and that was not the case. Mm -hmm. We had two guys who had mentioned that. So there were other comments uh, on this, uh, but not that. But that may also be because we are dealing with these 100 plus people. Yes. We have all seen that many of them yes. that they may think that's normal. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, right? Um, so you don't know whether to recommend, I mean, either you, either you restrict well, well, your, your workers to the 100 plus pool and then you, you can feel comfortable in injecting the attention questions or you or you, or you don't do that, yeah. and, and yeah. then you also don't know, yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, to, to me, the question is a, is a bit different. To me, the question is, under what conditions would you want people who are pre-selected for being highly conscientious, mm -hmm. right? I mean, somebody who has done 100 plus hits with a 95% approval rating mm -hmm. has been very conscientious across many, many tasks. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some tasks in, a, in, in psychology but that may be beneficial. But surely that's not your average person. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's not how people go through the day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I think what you're doing is you're screening out, if you do that, you're probably screening out a lot of people who are um, much more befuddled as they move through the day. Yeah. And you're probably helping yourself on syllogistic reasoning tasks mm -hmm. and hurting yourself on a lot of other things. I have not seen a study on that. It's something that you know, Dave Hauser wants to do uh, in you know, looking ahead after he's handed in his dissertation. <laughs> but, but, um, but there is an issue uh, where you might see something else, where you might see something like a better, better results, whatever that means, yeah. on heuristic phenomena yeah. in the subject pool and on these more logical tasks on MTurk, which essentially reflect a difference in how much attention you pay and how conscientious yeah. you, you are going about that. And it may very much depend on what you want to do. Yeah, so and I if you want a representative sample, you're not going to get it in the subject pool or on MTurk. You'll, yeah. you'll have to buy time on a national online panel. Yeah, so I think that's a really key distinction on the use of these internet-based uh, forums is that you, know, you, you, need to, you need to know specifically what your target worker group right, is. Right. And then you can use these kinds of uh, yeah. design manipulations to, to structure yeah. so that it will give the yeah. best yield for you. Yeah, yeah I think yeah, so. That would be a great yeah. model to yeah. develop. Just a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, the cognitive re uh, reflection test, yeah. is, that, is there an online version or where would you do direct me to go? Get uh, uh, just look up that, that piece. If you go to Google Scholar, and type in Frederick, which is the author, and cognitive reflection or CRT, you will find that paper. The whole test consists of three items. And it was, uh, it was designed for survey use, and all three items are in the original paper. And there's a large, relatively large follow-up literature on that. Okay, great. It became popular in finance circles. <laughs> 
but, but it's three items, so I mean, you don't need anything fancy. It's three items and you look if people give you the right answer or not. Oh. No. And it's all of that type. It's three items where if you, tr if you do the algorithm and you do the numbers, uh, you get it right. And if you rely on your gut, like, you know, it doubles and it's now full, and then what would have been half? Well, half is half, right? Then you're wrong. That's, that's all there is to it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.